Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world after having made a bunch of very fancy roads for our house. And as you can see, we finished this road down here. I fixed up this oversight on the slope over here, and it leads out into the plane, but it ends here. Someday, this road will travel far and wide. Right up to our translocator, right? That would be a very, very long road. Now we laid these roads so that we would know how to fit further builds into our estate here, and that is what we're going to do today. And we're doing this because I got a few requests from some people to make a video on how to kind of make builds come alive, how to make them feel less flat, less like that other block game, less like a cobblestone cube or a cobblestone box with a sloped wooden roof. We've all been there, and there's no shame in having a cobblestone box or a dirt hut if that's your style, and if it is, that's fine. So this video is for those of you who may be new to Vintage Story or you've been playing a while but haven't really caught on to building. My plan here is to show you sort of just a few simple tricks on how to level up your builds a bit and just make them pop a little bit. Bear in mind that everything in this video is sort of how I do things, and so how you might do them could be different. You might want to start from a different perspective, you might want to think about different things, you might hate my build palettes. That's entirely your opinion, and that's fine. So when I say you need to do something, I'm really saying that I need to do it in order to get my mind wrapped around whatever I'm building. Now, Vintage Story has a few advantages over that other block game, and honestly, a couple disadvantages too. One of those advantages is that we're not restricted to single blocks in terms of materials, because we can actually fit multiple materials into one block. And we did that right here on the barn, where we have these pine planks, and then we also added some of this granite cobblestone onto it. This is all one block. And there's also a whole ton of different stone types to play with, whereas the other block game has, I don't know, five or six different kinds of stone, and not all of them have all of the variations that you get from the stones in Vintage Story. That being said, there are some ways that the other block game shines a bit more than Vintage Story. Notice just how drab everything is. I mean, disregard the fact that it's winter, but our buildings are white, gray, black, brown, tan. Brown, gray, brown, black, green, brown, clear, and so on. In fact, one of the only pops of color we have in the whole area is this sort of line of sandstone rock, and it's just around one building. So we don't have that breadth of colors that you do in that other block game, though I don't know what the developers have in mind for the future. We could get, you know, brilliantly colored blues and greens and reds to work with, but in the current version of the game, we don't have that. So, we're going to work with what we've got. So, let's walk through some of my brainstorm process. The first thing I like to think about is, what is the purpose or function of the build? What are you going to use it for? And this is important because it may affect the dimensions of your build. For example, the area where we grind stuff in the quern. It needs to be at least a 3x3 area. If we're going to have an axle sending the power of multiple windmills down through a tower, well, we're going to have to have a 3x3 three three area for the gear. We're going to need some walls, so that's 5x5 five five at minimum. And then we need to have at least one more block for the windmills to stick out. So at minimum, 7x7. Seven seven. And also, you have to take the height into consideration. The greenhouse has kind of a lot harder rules as far as size requirements. And we were restricted to a 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven interior. And that is what we have in here. And are you going to keep animals in a pen somewhere? Well, you want to make sure you have enough room for them, and their feed troughs, and to make sure that your wall around them is high enough. Also high enough so that they can't step up on their troughs and over the wall. Bear in mind though that decoration and because I want to are absolutely valid functions for a build. You might just want something that looks pretty, and that's okay. In fact, that's kind of what most of this house is. I mean, this bridge serves no functional purpose. I can just walk across here if I wanted to, but no. I have a fancy bridge. It's pretty, I like it. This wall is not pretty, I don't like it. We'll get to it, I swear. So once you've decided what purpose your build has or what function it will serve, 
that's when you can start deciding the scope of it. The scope defines just how overboard you're going to go or not going to go when you build. You might go for the bare minimum. This house is something a bit above the bare minimum. I mean, our house could have been just a couple bedrooms, actually, honestly. Our house could have been one bedroom and, you know, a fireplace and somewhere to do smithing. And that is actually what that house over there was. We kind of fit everything, including storage, into one building while we were early enough in the game that we didn't really have so much junk to clutter up all our inventories. And our entire lives fit inside this area. Now as far as scope is concerned, bear in mind that Vintage Story is not a low effort game as far as return on investment. Everything you do in Vintage Story compared to, say, that other block game, takes maybe four to ten times as much effort as it does in the other block game. This house was a massive undertaking. We are 210 hours into the game, and this is everything we have. This is our entire life here. So bear in mind that when you're deciding on the scope for your builds, make sure you keep your expectations in check and just understand how much work's going to go into making every single block of plaster, for example, or you know, getting the materials to make bricks, or heck, smelting glass and making those window panes. Ugh, so much lead. The next thing to consider is the style or the feel of the build that you're going to be planning. Decide sort of what architectural style you want to work with, whether it's something that exists or whether you kind of want to wing it on your own. Some people might want to make very crazy magical castles that don't really have a main theme, while others, like us here, we have sort of a fantasy medieval theme. We've got, well, I think we have some sort of like Mediterranean inspiration for this plaster here, but the rest of this build is largely kind of fantasy medieval build, maybe Renaissance. And then everything else is, again, sort of medieval Renaissance builds, minus maybe the greenhouse. But you can also do like a postmodern house, or maybe a gothic chapel, or a Japanese dojo. And this is probably the most abstract part of planning your build but it is absolutely essential if you want to have a cohesive build that fits in with your other designs. And if you break ground and then your style changes partway through, don't be afraid to follow that to its logical end if the result pleases you or if you think it will. And the last thing you want to consider before you get started with planning a build is the build palette, namely what colors and textures and sometimes even shapes do you want to build with. And I generally recommend keeping it to maybe three-ish, possibly four, maybe five main colors, preferably three, and then one to three accent colors. So if you look at the house, our main colors are white, gray. You could almost call these two different main colors, the slate for the roof and the shale around the base. And then this gray, because we have a lot of gray on the corners and around the windows. And then our accent colors actually are probably, well, just the walnut. Not much of an accent, but it's different enough that it stands out when you see it. Oh, we have drifters. Hey, Brendo. <coughs> our forge has, let's see what, one, two, three, four, five, six colors going on. And the main colors are the limestone, almost sort of off-white, the oak pillars, I would say the roof is probably a main color, and then the accents would be this oak that we use for the trim, and these windows, and the sandstone polished blocks down here. I'd almost say that these are also an accent color. It's kind of everywhere, it's not as prevalent as the other colors are. And in addition to the color, you also want to consider the textures. You don't need to like have one of every texture that's in the game, but it can be good to have a mix of them. You know, we have this plain wall that I want to break up with some other textures, sort of where these pillars are, but having, you know, this sort of grainy, barky wood texture along with the smooth texture, along with the bricks, and then along with the sort of rounder texture of the cobble, that mix just kind of helps everything blend together 
while also giving definition between different functional or decorative areas. For instance, we have the bricks and the cobblestone to kind of denote that this is the chimney. There really isn't any other cobblestone in the whole area, except for maybe the floor, but a lot of the floor is covered with other things, and that is there to help sort of bring some of the elements from above down below. Now you might be constrained in terms of what your available textures and colors are. For instance, we have access to walnut, both the logs and the wood. We've got larch, which is sort of can be sort of a whitey gray blue on the outside, or if we use the wood, it's sort of a nice pale yellow peachy color. And we have pine and birch and oak, and we just found redwood and bald cypress recently, but we don't have any purple heart. We don't have any ebony, and we don't have any acacia or kapok. Kapok wood is similar in color to oak wood, but the logs are kind of more similar to birch, at least in terms of color and tone. But the purple heart, for instance, and the acacia, and even the ebony, are actually all pretty striking in their own ways. Like, the purple heart is a very purpley maroon color. The acacia is sort of a bright, vibrant red, and the ebony is black with striations of kind of like a redwood red mixed in. But we don't have some of those, so we're constrained to what we have to work with. And your local stone strata may also determine what you have access to. We have, in general, where these columns of chests are, we have access to these kinds of stones. And where we don't have them, I just sort of put placeholders for things like kimberlite and claystone, which we did just get access to through the translocator. We don't have any bauxite. We do have suavite, but you can't do as much with suavite as you can with other stones. You can polish it, you can use the full blocks, and you can use cobblestone, but you can't make bricks, for instance. So you may end up just having to work with what you have, or if that doesn't satisfy you, you could go on an adventure to find more materials. But today isn't about adventures to find materials, today is about building. So let's talk about the structure that I want to build. So the build that I've been thinking about, I kind of want to put right between where these two rifts are. It'd be perfect. But I was thinking, I want to make a pottery shack so that we have a place to finally, once again, fire clay items. You guys yelled at me for having this really ugly dirt hovel thing over here where I was doing all my clay firing, and I got in trouble for taking it down and then rebuilding it when I needed to fire more clay items, and so I figured, you know what, let's just pave over it. So, we did. So we need an actual place to fire our clay items. And what better place to put it than right here? Oh good, they went away. So the purpose of this build is going to be to have an area to fire our clay items. The secondary purposes would, I guess, be having a bit of a place to do some clay throwing, and maybe a little bit of storage, just so if we have clay projects that we're working on, we have a place to keep them while we're, you know, not actively working on them. And, as with every build in this world, the last purpose is decorative. I want this to be a build that looks interesting and maybe even fits in with the landscape and our buildings here. Second, as far as scale is concerned, the only real consideration I have as far as functional scale is I want to be able to fire at least 15 items at once. So if I were doing 15 clay vessels, I want to be able to do 15 of those at once, at minimum. I don't really want to go too crazy, like I don't feel the need to have 25 kilns, but if we end up with that, that's okay. Everything else I want to keep relatively small. I don't want it to be a big build that's going to overshadow our greenhouse here, or the forge, which that's actually a pretty big build. So. This area should be perfect for that kind of design. I think we have plenty of space to work with here. The interior doesn't need to have a whole lot of space for storage or for our work area, because, I mean, we just need one block where we can make clay items. Third, we have style. We already have the fantasy medieval style that we've been using for, you know, forever, and I think I don't want to deviate from that. And what I'll do is I'll find a sort of fresh take on the style 
that will pull elements from our existing buildings and maybe some textures and colors from them as well as maybe something new and make it its own building that still looks like it belongs with the rest of these. And last, the color palette. I'm going to go pull a few odds and ends from a couple chests and we'll lay them out and talk about them and I'll give my thoughts on how I want the build to look. So as far as our build palette goes, um, I want to do definitely some wood as a sort of support, just like we usually do. And this time I actually want to use some of the oak wood. It's kind of a nice warm color. And I was thinking that the inside, which mind you, the inside and the outside may have different or at least somewhat different color palettes because you might not want the exterior look on the inside. So the inside, I think I might want to go with some birch floors. They're not quite as vibrant or as pale as the larch, but they have their own sort of charm. Now we are going to be stuck with the sort of brown of the standard doors. That doesn't really count as an accent color, I don't think, because that kind of fits in with the rest of the brown tones here. Now what I was thinking was for an accent color is that we could have a splash of green in the house. We're going to pull some of the greenhouses style into this build. And I was thinking we can have some peridote cobblestone and stone brick. And I don't want to go overboard with this because this is kind of a, I mean, it's kind of a harsh color. It's, I mean, honestly, it's kind of like a pukey color. Sorry for that image. But it is nice to work into a build, especially since there are so few color options in the game right now. So I don't want to go crazy with this, but I do want to have the green as an accent color. Now, I want to show you something that... Okay, I don't want to show you this part of it, but um, don't look, it's embarrassing. But um, this is kind of where I've been getting my stone from. It's, it's hideous. It's like right behind the tower too, but ignore it. We're not going here right now. Now, what I did do is I went and dug a shaft down to the mantle here and took a core sample because sometimes you can get really far down and hit new rock strata and that's just what happened. So it turns out that not only do we have a source of more peridote here, but I found something else interesting as I caught the scent of emerald and decided to follow it wherever it led. And yes, it's lava. The sound of it at least. But we found some phyllite. This is sort of like a pinkish grayish rock that really, as far as I'm aware, only shows up when you get really deep in the world. And I thought that this could be an interesting color to use as a secondary accent. Maybe in like a chimney or a foundation or just something that isn't a main part of the building. So while being done here saps my sanity, I'm going to spend some time relieving some of this phyllite -like and some of the peridote and I want to bring it up to use in our build. And look at that. I actually found some emerald. It seems to be kind of scattered throughout here. Like, there's like one piece here and there. I found one earlier, and I took a sample of it in Phylite. That was when I originally found this place, but... Yeah, so now I have some in Peridoite. I think I will try to preserve this particular piece here. Because, you know, that's what we do around here. Don't mind if I do. Okay, we are back, and I am I think ready to go. By the way, I uh I put this little window in here because I was tired of having the darkness of the basement cause the music to stop. And well, unfortunately, this don't do sh anyway, let's get to work on our pottery shack, right? I have our little project bin out here. Let's just drop a few things in here and clean up our inventory a bit. And we're going to go ahead and tear down this little sample we have going on here. Now, one of the tricks that I like to use in some of the builds that we've done here is there's sort of a 3x3 three three rule. Well, let's take a look at the smithy, for example. So, as you can see, we have three block sections. 
everywhere. Literally everywhere. Three, three, three. That was three before the chimney got stuck in there. Three, three, and so on. And this is a really easy way of measuring out a build and also making a consistent pattern that you can then play with or vary as you see fit. It also gives you these nice sort of typically 3x3 three three or 3x4 three or if you make a taller build 3x5 sort of sections of wall where you can put a window or hang a lamp or otherwise decorate and it just helps sort of keep things simple rather than having a big blank canvas like say over here you have a smaller one and even a little bit can go a long way here and we're going to use that principle for this build here since we're doing a pretty small build I'm going to go for the 3x3 three three rule here and I think we're only going to have it be a couple sections long. Now, when you do the 3x3s, three if you're doing supports like this, then you're going to have sort of a 5x5 five five pattern where each 5x5 five five section is butted up against the next one. So this beam here is part of both this 3x3 three three and this 3x3's three 5x5 five 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 bounding box. So I'm going to play with some measurements and get this going on, and we'll see what we come up with. Okay, everyone, I did some fiddling around, and I think this is about sort of the design I want. This here will be our kiln area, and over here will be sort of the potter's shack. Maybe we have an artisan who lives here who makes all of our pottery for us, our fine china, that we then sell to the artisans and luxuries merchants, whenever we find one. And I was originally going to have this attached to the house, but then I remembered that we have wood, and we do not want wood anywhere near this build here, this part of the build. So this is going to stay separate from the house, and the shack itself will be right here. So as you can see, we have our 3x3s, three and I actually missed one that I want to put here. Yes. And what I'm envisioning is we're going to have a little porch, and that'll be the access to the house, and this... 3x3 three three will actually be outside. We'll have our door here. It goes into the house. We'll have house, house, house. House, house, house. I'm thinking like a pottery wheel over here. And then we'll have a second door here that leads straight out to the kilns. So now we've talked 3x3, three three, but you can spruce it up so that it doesn't look so well planned out or so samey. And you can do that by doing this over here, where I have this kiln area it's going to be kind of cocked 45 degrees so that it doesn't sit square with everything else. I also have it so that the door comes out here and it's not really centered on anything going on here. Other ways you can spice things up are by punching out, like, let's say right here we're going to have our fireplace. We could sort of have it be a fireplace that sticks out of the house. Kind of like we did back over on the OG house, where the fireplace sort of stuck out like a little, you know, bum sticking out into the air. And that can kind of cut through the shape of the build, kind of like our chimney does right over there. You can also have portions of the build that are at a diagonal or slightly offset, or maybe a section that doesn't follow the 3x3 three three rule. You could have, for instance, say a 5x3 or a 5x5 five five that sticks out a little farther over this way. I'm not going to do that here, but what I am going to do is I think that this section right here will be elevated one block more than the rest of the house. And then, I think I might sort of turn this into like a little tower, as if maybe this used to be a chapel or something, or maybe some kind of tower for drying meats, or, I don't know, making musket balls, and that the potter sort of moved in and made it his own area. And by doing that, we'll break up the roof line, I think, even more effectively than these dormers do. So I'm going to start putting some ideas together on how I'm going to fit this build palette together in this area. And I had another idea. I might want some blue clay bricks. I was thinking fire clay, but it might be too bright for what I'm thinking. But blue clay bricks could be used here as sort of a foundation. And that way, rather than having these logs stick out from the build, they'll be more flush with the foundation, and it'll give the build a different look, sort of a, a taller look in a way. And also, since this is the potter's house, I would think that he would be thrilled to have bricks. 
don't you? By the way, I came to check on our cheese, and it looks like the wax cheese, although it is bugged, it looks like it did actually ripen after reaching 100% a second time. So, I guess it's not quite as badly bugged as I thought, but it is still annoying. It seems like it took about twice as long to cure as the others, since it counted 100 twice. So, it is morning, and I had a bit of an epiphany. I don't have any finished blue clay bricks. So, that means that we're going to have to start with the actual kiln area, which isn't a bad thing. I brought along some shale cobblestone for the floor. I figured shale would be good because that way it's sort of like, it's sooty, you know, we're, we're constantly burning grass and sticks and logs here and peat and whatever. So the, the ground here is going to be really sooty and gross. And then I think I'll use the phyllite. I like these sort of purpley, pinky bricks that are like, they look just like granite if you're not really paying attention. But when you get close, you can sort of see these, these little snatches of pink sort of running through it. And I kind of like the look. And the roof. Ah, uh, the roof. We won't talk about the roof. Let's get to it. There we go. Now this wall isn't going to keep out any drifters, but I don't really expect to be, you know, in urgent need of some clay item, like a shingle in the middle of a temporal storm, so I'm not too concerned. Now the roof. The roof, the roof, the roof. Um, <laughs> well, look, I told you we weren't going to talk about it, so we're just not going to talk about it. The goal is to have blue clay shingles on the roof, okay? That's the goal. That's not today. Well, at least not right now. Uh, 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 uh. I heard you. I heard you thinking. Not a word. Not a word. There, it's done. Episode over. Well, I guess it's time to go make us some more blue clay shingles, because I have 19 left in a chest somewhere and a couple blocks, but that ain't gonna cut it. So I will see all of you on the other side of this crafting process. But first, we fire these bricks. Oh, I couldn't have planned that better if I tried. Exactly enough for three stacks of bricks. Okay, I'll take it. It's good to be back. Okay, with our clay shingles firing behind us, let's get to work on our potter. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift these up one more block, because, like that, because I want to replace this sort of bottom row with the blue clay bricks. And with that, we're going to take out these, and since these aren't trees, they aren't natural, they will actually hover in the air. Hmm, conundrum. Let's do this. 
We'll bring to the ground. There we are. So let's go ahead and we're going to lay foundations. Now I think with this being the deck, I'm not going to do bricks right there. And I'm going to leave this alone since this is going to be where our fireplace is. And I'm going to replace most of this stuff with Phylite Stone Brick. Just going to lift these up a little bit more. And next we're going to start filling in our 3x3 three three sections. And in order to get some depth we're going to lay our wood planks sort of along the back edge of the foundation there. And I'm leaving room to put our doors. We're going to go here and here. And then we're going to just lay out all of this wood. Okay, it's morning, so let's go ahead and get this deck in. We are just going to do a bit of this. And here on the edge, just to make it so that it looks like it is solid on the ground, we're going to put full blocks there. That's a little better. That is better. Okay, so now we have this area. Now for this, this is going to be the raised section of our house. So I'm just going to put a couple blocks in place. And I want to use some polished peridoite. And that is just going to go in like this. So we have most of the palette of the house already added. So let's go ahead and add the floors so that while we're working in here, we're not one block lower and having trouble reaching things. And for that, I brought the birch. And what I want to do with this is I'm bringing actually both full blocks and the slabs. And the reason is that I want to do sort of a parquet floor. So we have this sort of alternating pattern. I'm going to do that by placing these blocks vertically, which turns their horizontal texture 90 degrees. If I put them on the side, it would go right across like that. So by putting them straight down, we get this nice sort of checkerboard parquet pattern going on. And we're going to do that the whole way down to here. And then we'll step up into this area and we'll do a smaller one right up here. And then for the threshold, I think we'll just do some of that. A little bit of contrast and to bring this element over into this area here again. So I'm going to go ahead and raise these up a few more blocks and keep that moving. And we will see how this ends up. Now, for this upper area wall here, I want to continue the peridoite farther up, but we're also going to pop it in half a block, just like all the other walls here are sort of lined up with the blocks on the inside, but on the outside they are one block offset. So to do that, I'm going to primarily be using some of these peridoite stone brick, and they are a somewhat lighter color, which is nice because you want to have typically a your heavier colors toward the ground, aside from your roof, so that you have your kind of main palette sandwich between the two of them. We're just going to kind of randomly intersperse these along with the cobblestone. And what we're going to do is we will chisel down the cobblestone, but I wanted to use full blocks of cobblestone because the texture is a little bit better.
And there we have windows with sills. And I think I'm going to put some sills on these windows too. And I don't know, let's, let's see what an oak stair sill looks like. Hmm. You know what? I think that might get a little bit lost. Because although you have the depth here, there really isn't any contrast to sort of notice the depth. So I think I might replace these with maybe walnut. Let's try some walnut. Yeah, I think I like that better. In fact, I might maybe even chisel this away so we have just the walnut sill, but to have the oak underneath. Maybe we could try that. Yes, I think I like that more. So we'll do these sort of walnut sills, and we'll chisel them in with the oak planks here so that they look like they fit in with the rest of the wall. Okay, with the window frame sorted, let's put the windows in. And I really like the look of the walnut windows. So we're just going to keep using some of that. I need my lead. So we have our paned glass. And we have eight more because I want to do a second story above this. Now again, we won't have access to the second story except maybe like a little shelf up here to put some work items. But I wanted to have this sort of just be a little pop-out piece behind the roof. Okay, and next let's get our fireplace in. So I want the fireplace to be a little sort of a pop-out thing. So we're going to actually put it right there. And that'll be where we put, maybe we'll just do it right now, put our fire pit right here. That goes there. So then let's get these brick slabs. And we're going to go ahead and we'll just place these here. And we're going to just use the chisel to grow them outward. And then let's see. We're going to have this come up. So we'll do another layer of full blocks, I think. And what we'll do is we'll turn these into full blocks temporarily and then we'll sort of chisel them away. Like so. And that way we can get to the fireplace so we can get into it necessarily. Maybe we'll do a similar thing on this layer here. And we'll just start bringing this up. Ooh, temporal storm's approaching. And a heavy one. And here we will just pop all these out. There we go. And then we will just do a bit of this on the ground. And that ought to do. And then I think we'll do another layer right here. Like so. And I think that should do it for the chimney. And if this isn't high enough, then we'll come back in later and we will push it up. Or if it's too high, we'll bring it down. Okay, it is second story time. So let's get up there and work on that. Okay, well, I'm going to go and deal with this temporal storm, and we will pick up when it's over.
Okay, well, I am back from that temporal storm, and I'm a bit salty because some other drifter killed the double-headed drifter that I was killing myself, and that cut his loot in half, so I only got a couple gears out of that deal. I'm going to refill my inventory, and we'll get back to work on the potter's house. Now, we're going to have the roof coming off right about here, so I'm going to use these upside-down stairs to fill in the gap and... Just sort of make it so that if you're looking up from here, you don't just see the underside of the roof block. And then we're going to repeat the same walnut upside down staircase right here, up at the very top of this tower. And the whole reason we do this kind of thing is because when you have a large area, whether it's a vertical or horizontal or other kind of area, or in multiple directions, you want to break up the pattern a bit unless that sort of flat image is what you're going for like the house as you can see we broke it up with these bricks in the corners and we still do have kind of big flat areas and that one right there i promise you it is getting treatment at some point just not today and we have these decorations around the windows which will eventually get propagated over here and that sort of breaks that up too in this case we're just sort of going with banding in order to perform that function. At the top here, it also helps to frame the peridoite stuff so that way it doesn't just run right into the roof. And speaking of the roof, I think we're about ready for one. Yeah, fired blue clay shingles that are really hard to tell apart from the gel cobblestone. Wow, that's a lot of stacks of shingles. And we're gonna start just by aligning this here. And one thing that you can always do to help just finish your build off is always bring the roof one block over the edge of the house, both lengthwise and widthwise. That just helps give the roof some more definition, and it's also realistic because your roof's going to hang over your house, except for in certain areas or if you have like a flat roof. That way you don't have water coming down the roof and running down the walls. That can actually cause water problems. And also by having the water drip away from the house, it also is less likely to get sort of under the foundation and into your basement. Now this guy has no basement, so we don't care about him, but it'll look good. Now, speaking of roofs, and there we now have, finally, an official kiln pit. Pit kiln cover. No more dirt. See? I told you we'd talk about it. So aside from the roofs, we have a couple places left. We have the gable here. We have the roof there. And we have the interior. And I think we might even spruce up the exterior a little bit what we could do if we're feeling dangerous is we could actually you know what we could make a little deck right here like so and we'll just put some slabs there then we'll just cut some stairs like that and then we'll add a couple wooden fences. Done. Oh, so much better. See how that breaks up the sort of long, flat line of the build here? And if you find a long, flat part of one of your builds, don't be afraid to pop a little porch out, or maybe like a bay window, or some other feature that just brings the house out a little and breaks up that long sight line. And if we're feeling extra cheeky, we can sort of break it up a little further by putting some of these along the corners where the posts come down as if the posts need some extra foundation in order to be stable. And here I think what we'll do is we'll do a bit of that. Here we go. And we'll just do this. 
And now we're also breaking up the long lines along the bottom, so we don't have any section that's more than three blocks long. Now for the gables here, I think I'm going to be in favor of keeping it pretty simple. And what we're going to do is we are going to just drop some of those. And then we'll just pop a little window right there. Just to let some more light in up at the top of the build. And now we have a fully enclosed house with a tower that has no roof. What I think what we'll do to break up the interior is we're going to come in and right at, I think, this level. One, two, three, four, yeah. We will just bring some beams across. And those might even be a little bit high. Maybe if I lowered them, we could maybe use them for, like, storage. Yeah, if we bring them down, we could maybe put some pottery up there. And it'll be more visible than having it this high up. There we go. Now, for the tower roof, I think what we're going to do is something a little bit different. Because you can also bring in some color and variation to your builds by changing up the color of your roof parts. So if you have one roof that's distinct from another area of the roof, you can get away with using a different material. Now, we're going to use some slate, and that'll bring a really nice dark cap up on the top of our build here. Because this blue clay, both the bricks and the shingles, they're more of like a medium dark, they're not super dark, and this will help sort of weigh the top of our build down a bit visually. I'm going to first bring this up one more block because I don't want to hide the walnut trim here. Then we're going to just go ahead and start hanging our roofing blocks off of it. We're also varying the roof by having a conical roof, or in this case a square cone, instead of the long barn style roof below. That also helps bring something different to the top part of the build. And something else you can do, just to be a little cheeky, is you can vary it up at the very top by putting inverted corners. And then you have an option. You can either just plop down some of these right here, and then put your final roof piece right about here, for a little bit of variation. Or, if you want to raise it up another block, you can sort of make a little playhouse style cap on it. And I'll show you what that looks like. We basically have a little bit of a dormer in each direction here. So this is a little goofy up close, but at a distance, it looks kind of like nothing, because it's too dark to see. Let's just drop our lantern there. Somewhere up here. Can I hang you under here? There we go. Like so, you get that sort of extra definition up at the top there, with little fake dormers sticking out. And the last part that I think is, while it's the most free, it's also sort of the most intimidating part of the process, because since you have a lot more freedom to experiment on the inside, I think people get intimidated by the amount of choice that can go into how to decorate the interior. So we're going to start by, I think over here, I want to mark out a spot to put a potter's wheel. And this will be kind of the big chiseling item that we do for this build. And then, let's see, we'll put his pallet right there. He'll kind of sleep up here, farther away from the drifters, I guess. And then over here, he's got an old breakfast table and a simple chair. And of course, since he's the potter, we're going to have storage in the form of a clay vessel right there. And then I'm thinking, let's do some more decoration with shelving units. And then what I want to do is I think I want to just add a bit of support for the roof here. 
I'm not going to hide the whole thing. I was thinking about it, but that just seems a little too much. So we're going to do a bit of that. Can I reach you? There we go. And then a better place for this lantern. There we go. That's better illumination. But let's start working on a pottery wheel. I'm looking at the leech-style pottery wheel as something that would be appropriate for this place and sort of the technology level we have, even though the leech might be a little more advanced than I'm thinking. Okay, and there we have our potter's wheel. It has a pine wood frame. And it's got a granite wheel and axle for the clay throwing surface. And then we have a larch kick wheel down here. And we can sit here with our backs to the fire and stay warm all winter while we work on our clay. Now, I think we should probably drop a few more things here. I mean, the potter might have some spare clay bricks here, like so. Fire clay bricks maybe thrown in the corner back here. And yeah, I think we're about done. Well, everyone, there you have it. A full build from start to finish, from concepts to breaking ground to getting the roof on. We even covered some basic interior decoration. And there are some more odds and ends we could do as time permits. We could get crazy with the chiseling, we could change up how the roof looks, we could do all manner of different things, but your final design will depend on your own preferences. You might decide that my interior is too plain or too cluttered, or you want the functional area to be up here, where you put your potter's wheel up in the tower, and that's fine too. Now we didn't cover the outside, like in terms of exterior decoration, things like landscaping, uh, bushes and trees and so on, and I think that's because I don't want to do that in winter, and I also kind of consider that a different aspect to a build. Usually, I find landscaping easier to do when I have builds that are already in place and I can figure out what's going to fit between them. So we will cover landscaping in another episode, preferably when it's a bit greener out. Anyway, that is going to be about a wrap for this episode. I hope you enjoyed our adventure in making a pottery shack and in putting together a new clay firing area. We can finally use it for reels. And I hope that for those of you who are looking for a tutorial on how to just bring your builds up from basic cobblestone shacks, found this episode helpful. Anyway, as always, my name has been Kurzar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.